So this brings us to the next section where we're going to do what economists call experiments. <clears throat> now these aren't real experiments in the scientific sense. What they are is we're going to say in our model, if we accept that our model is true, what happens if we make a few changes? What happens if I change certain variables? What effects does it have on other variables? And in that way, we hope to kind of learn more about the real world. So let's do a few of these experiments. And we'll start with experiment one. What happens if I increase pi, my profit income, or I decrease t, my taxes? And notice that these are really the same thing, right? They both have the same effect. So let's first look at this graphically, okay? So graphically, I'll draw my budget line. As I said, we'll do that quite a few times in this course. So here's my budget line. It looks something like this. This is H L C. This is going to be pi one minus T one. So I'm going to like, I won't tell you, or that is, like I said, it doesn't matter if it's pi that's increasing or T that's decreasing. So here I'll just have, I won't, specify which one is changing. But in either case, now imagine we do have a change. So let's say pi increases or t decreases. That's going to change the budget line in the following way, right? Now, if I consume all of my hours in leisure, now I'm making a higher non-wage income either because my taxes are lower or I'm making more profits. Meanwhile, the slope will remain the same, right? As I work, I still make W income per hour. So the slope of the budget line remains the same. But now what happens to our indifference curves? Well, here's our initial indifference curve. Let's say it was here. This was our initial optimal point, okay? And then our second indifference curve after the fact I claim will be somewhere here. Okay, so in other words, it's going to result in an increase in both consumption and leisure. Okay, so let me write that. Both consumption and leisure increase. Why? Okay, why? Well, the reason is because of one of the assumptions we made before which is that consumption and leisure are both normal goods. Both normal goods. And remember we said that the definition of normal goods is when my income increases, and this is one such case, when my income increases, I consume more of consumption because it's a normal good. And I consume more of leisure because it's a normal good. So notice that there's two kind of economic implications here. So I have this on the next slide. What's the significance? Well, <clears throat> it's that, remember, labor supply is total hours of work minus leisure. In this case, when pi minus t increases, when my non-wage income increases, that means that leisure is going up and therefore labor supply is falling. This is the economic implication that's particularly interesting about this. Obviously, if we give people more money, they're likely to consume more of it. What's interesting about this is that we claim, or this model claims, that when we increase your non-wage income, you also work less. And I have here, I wrote, this is a concern that some have about income supports during COVID-19. So, for example, in Canada, we have the CERB. So these are supports that are paid to people who are no longer working because of COVID-19. And the fear is that even those that might be able to return to work won't because they now have this additional non-wage income, these additional payments from the government, which you could think of as being a decrease in T. And so as a result, they're decreasing their labor supply. And so the fear is that even if these people could return to work, they won't. 
And so here I have just one headline. This is from the CBC. I saw another similar one in the Wall Street Journal this morning. Uh, but this is from PEI. It says, facing fears workers won't work. PEI asks Ottawa to change COVID benefit programs. And the, the quote from the premier of PEI says, I don't think anyone wants to see people paid to stay home while we have vacancies. So you can see that this is kind of that uh, same implication. The implication is we increase the non-wage income of people, so why would they work? Um, so here, I'm a little critical, and obviously it must depend on the situation. But I say here, in general, is this a reasonable concern? So one way to evaluate this is to think what you would do. So let's forget for a second about COVID-19 because it's uh, particularly fraught with all kinds of complications, but let's just think about the general case. So say you've completed your degree, you're working a full-time job, and suddenly your non-wage income increases. So I don't know, let's say that um, you have some investments and suddenly they start doing very well, okay, and you start getting more money. Or alternatively, let's say that the government has some kind of rebate check that they've started giving you. What do you do? Would you start working fewer hours? This is a good way to evaluate this claim, right? Think about what you yourself would do. And I say here, there's a few reasons why this might not be the case, why you might not follow what the model says. And that's because there's a few assumptions that the model makes that might fail. Okay, so let's start with one. Maybe the more obvious one is that one assumption is that workers can choose their own hours. So the way the model assumes this is that the worker looks at the wage in the market, looks at their non-wage income, and then chooses the amount of leisure hours to take. In general, this isn't true, right? In general, many workers are paid a salary with an expectation of working, say, nine to five. Okay, even part-time hourly work, hours aren't that flexible. I mean, I worked in retail for many years, and even though I was part-time and so had some some flexibility in the amount of hours I worked, there wasn't that much. There was an expectation that I worked so many hours, and even if I wanted to work more, often those hours weren't available. So even then it was pretty inflexible. And even for workers who can choose their own hours, say academics or lawyers, again, there's often an expectation of working however many hours, and often your wage doesn't directly depend on uh, how many hours you work. And so it's not really a great mm, example of this model. Now, one thing you could say is certainly you can choose labor supply equals to zero. So, I mean, you at least have that choice. So what I mean here is you could always choose to quit your job and to not work at all. So certainly you have that choice. And so thinking about just this assumption, imagine instead what someone's budget constraint would look like in the case where they can't choose their own hours, okay? So you're at a job currently, and let's say, here's leisure, there's H, and let's say this is the point associated with working, I don't know, 9 to 5, okay? That's what your job expects of you. Then really, you don't have a full line of choices here. You have two choices, right? And so you can imagine that maybe you're on this utility curve, and suddenly there's an increase. This is pi minus t. Suddenly there's an increase in your non-wage income. Okay, so now we go to pi minus t2. Well, now you have the two following points. So let's say it increases to here, and this point increases also as well. And so you still, will probably choose to work nine to five, right? You don't have that much leeway and certainly you don't want to quit and earn nothing, right? You would need a particularly large increase in your non-wage income to want to quit and earn nothing. So that's one assumption that might fail. What's another one? Well, that's that there's this built-in assumption that people don't like work and they do like leisure, right? I don't ever want to work. I just want to consume as much leisure as possible. Well, you can ask my friends, many of whom work in the service industry, how they're enjoying their forced leisure during 
the COVID-19 crisis. And the spoiler is they're not. I mean, many people get a sense of purpose from work, right? Many people enjoy working. It gives you structure to your day. It makes you feel like you're doing something. And being forced into leisure like these people have been, like my friends have been, it turns out they don't like it very much. They'd rather be working. And it's not just because of the lost income, because often that's made up for by, for example, CERB, these payments from the government. <clears throat> it's that they would prefer to be working in many cases for the reasons I just explained. And so, again, how would this look if we kind of adjusted the model for that assumption? Well, you can imagine that in or, uh, uh, indifference curves might look, bleh, might look a little different. Okay, so you can imagine that indifference curves might have an upward sloping point like this, for example. And why is that? That's because it could be that too much leisure is a bad thing, right? So at this point, to be indifferent between consuming this point and this much more leisure, because I don't want to consume more leisure, because too much leisure is a bad thing, you have to compensate me by also increasing my consumption. And so I claim that it's possible that in fact these indifference curves have an upward sloping aspect to them. And so how does that change the model? Well, again, imagine we have our budget line like this, and imagine we're initially at a point like that, okay? And then we have an increase in our budget line like that. Well, then depending kind of on what point of the indifference curve I'm at, I might not increase my leisure at all, right? In fact, I might decrease it or stay exactly the same. And it kind of depends on exactly the shape of the indifference curve and its slope. 